I'm a huge proponent of circular economies because that's how Bitcoin spreads. You can't sustain a functioning civilization without something that allows you to tr transport that value over great distances almost instantly. That is the beauty of Bitcoin. You control the money, you control society. We advocate for just making up your own mind, using your own proof of work, validate everything that you come across. If you're going to decentralize your money, if you want to be a sovereign individual, you have to get your kids out of school. When you have a monetary system that is sound and hard and true and, and has integrity and requires proof of work and it requires those values from its users, what kind of culture could that bring? I understand, Diana, that you have written more books before that book already? Actually, this is my first book, although I do a lot of writing. I've um, written a dissertation. I'm going to be turning the book that we just wrote, Shalsa Satoshi, The Story of Money and the Rise of Bitcoin. Uh, Joel is a co-author on that. And I'm going to be taking that material and turning it into children's books to teach them about the story of money and Bitcoin, but on a level that they can understand. I will eventually have a lot of books and I have about six other titles on the story of series that I want to write, education being the next one. But this is my first full length book that I've published. Oh, really cool. Perfect. Really cool. Uh, and Joel, you, it's also your first book, like that a co-author. Uh, as a co-author, yes, but um, I also uh, have ambitions to write other things, though I'm, my background is in um, entertainment and film, uh, so my, um, uh, my goals are to be more in the fictional realm. So, um, so I'm, I'm just helping out with Deanna and helping her tell her story. So while we both have writing ambitions, we're, we're not writing exactly the same thing, though we do share a common love for Bitcoin. Uh, really, really cool. Diana, what, what, what do you think is, is uh, like, what's the main goal of, of that book? Like, what, what do you want to accomplish with it? So my, um, I was a professor for a long time, a professor of humanities, history and anthropology. So I took that approach to the book, um, telling the stories that I've been sharing with students for years about um, history and specifically about economic history and how we go from barter systems and even as you know, recent as the 1950s, there were still cultures on the planet that were using solely a barter system. So not everybody had adopted money. And so, and there are still some really um, kind of um, off the beaten path or remote indigenous cultures that still use a lot of barter today. And so I wanted to tell the story of how humans have invented and then broken and then reinvented money and even banking over time through history and these anthropological examples. So it's really mostly a history slash uh, tell book telling the stories of different groups of humans and their relationship with money and what how they've dealt with it and what they've done. Oh, really, really and then, cool. Um, and it, I think the goal, like the purpose of my writing was to explain why we need Bitcoin. Um, as someone who teaches and who um, I teach reading and writing, but I also teach history and literature. And if you don't explain the why we need something, then it's just some new fad, shiny new object toy, you know, something that you kids ask for Christmas and then they're going to, you know, re forget about it a month later type of thing. And if you don't understand that why and you hit people's pain points, then it's not going to catch on. And this is like my mission is to orange pill the world the best I can. And particularly as a teacher, I want to help orange pill younger, like the next generation of Bitcoiners. But you have to have that why, because if they can't relate to it in their own lives, then it's not going to be, um, they're not going to integrate it the way that it should be integrated interesting and and for those who uh, i feel like in the in the bitcoin community the history of money is way more understood than in any other uh, usually audience that, that that you usually speak um but for those who didn't uh fully uh, uh understand what the history of money is maybe as a beginning question what is the history of of, of money and why does the history of money make Bitcoin so clear as a solution going forward? It's it's actually quite complex. Um, and so you go from barter where you just have this, you know, mutual needs. Um, and once 
you realize that I'm a farmer and I am growing, you know, maize, if you're in the new world or corn or grain or Elmer or um, Einkor wheat, if you're in Mesopotamia and that's all you're growing. And as civilizations get more complex, the need for some sort of um, intermediary to exchange something that shows some sort of value that becomes more and more necessary. Because when you're doing barter system, you can keep mental ledgers. And those work for really simple and small societies where everybody knows everybody. There's typically some sort of familial relationship and they, you don't have that complexity. But once you start interacting or trying to exchange with strangers, you don't have that trust and things get more complex. And so the Mesopotamians, they didn't have coinage but they would like take little bits of metal called shekels. They would melt these down and they had a certain value that was um, measured with grain, a bushel of grain. Once you get that, then you're going to start having banks because you're going to have to have someone who's going to distribute that metal. There's going to have to be known weights. So they have these weight stones so they can measure the metal. And it gets that alone gets very complicated. So when you start having people live in sedentary societies, there becomes a more complex need for exchange. And really money is just a, you know, it's a medium of exchange, right? So um, that's, that's the, what, where it starts. And then as banking gets more complex and then the, you know, the sort of rise of some sort of centralized authority overseeing banking or money, whether it's individual bankers or if it is, um, you know, the state or the government that is in charge of it. If um, in Mesopotamia, the banks were in the temples, so that was very much tied to the religion. And so once you have that centralization, then you get into power and control. You control the money, you control society. We know that, right? Especially in the fiat world that we're living in now. Um, so I think it's a really interesting story. And by spending time, I mean, the book is um, 16 chapters with an epilogue. And there's only two chapters on Bitcoin, but by spending time and really focusing in on what Rome, what was going on in Rome and the banking system and what these emperors were doing and how these law codes evolved over time. I, I'm a historian, so there's a lot of links or uh, a lot of mentions of primary sources on our webpage, um, shellsusatoshi.com. I have a whole thing about primary sources relating to money going all the way back to the first law codes. And I'm always adding more and more sources to that repository. So people, if they want to see what actually was written, what is in the history, not interpreted by somebody else, they can go there. And those are the documents that we use to write this, the book, to tell that story. Mm, it was really interesting. And, yeah. If I could just add to that, in helping shape the book and, and reviewing it um, as Deanna was working on it, uh, it struck me how often the same story played out over and over again. Um, the society that used the monetary medium would um, run into some kind of roadblock that was limited by the nature of the medium and have to reinvent it in order to get past that so that society could continue evolving. And, um, and we would see that um, as a, uh, you know, uh, in Deanna's example of the um, bits of metal that the early civilizations like the Mesopotamians, Mesopotamians used for um, for um, a an intermediary of exchange had to evolve into standardized weights so that the money could be used um, at greater distances with greater population and greater societal complexity and it happened over and over again and uh it's and when you see it happen over and over again you realize that there's some basic um uh and and fundamental ways that human beings relate to each other that are timeless and so the lessons that we can draw from mesopotamia rome and uh even china and further as human societies evolved we see the same um the, the same dynamics at play today. And that's what leads to Bitcoin. Do you think, Joel, that uh, all that what Diana said, but also you said, and history of money, that we kind of melt all those different fiat currencies, all those uh, different <laughs> sorts of monies that we have 
uh, are melting in Bitcoin as a singularity of, of, of money at some point? I love the word singularity because it, it does um, imply a certain kind of apex uh, to the evolution of money. We, we touched on, and Deanna specifically touched on um, the, the need for an intermediary that facilitates trade transactions and relationships between human beings, right? So that was the initial use case of money. But then as society evolved and became more complex, the trade relationships not only grew more complex in the kind of trades that were made, you know, like um, uh, if you, if you're a farmer and you're not just going to take your, your harvest and sell it at the moment you harvest it, you're going to need to plan for the future. So you're going to have to invent some ways to get paid so that you can put your, um, uh, you know, invest in the farm. So you have to develop some kind of uh, like even a futures market. So you could defer um, the the initial investment at the time of, until uh, the time of your harvest. So it gets really complicated. And that's where c more complex money comes in. But the, the, the other story that keeps coming in is that um, throughout human history, in order to have the money be accepted by um, audiences that are far off and complex, they had to imbue the money with some kind of trust. They had to trust that the money was good. And initially, with something like gold, um, some kind of precious metal, we, it could be trusted because it was rare, it was hard to dig out of the ground, <clears throat> but... Um, but over time, that kind of money uh, showed its limitations, and then um, money had to evolve so it could be um, used and and validated by authority figures and and people who could legitimately apply trust to the money. And people had to believe that, which also leads the uh, it opens the door to corruption. And that's the new dynamic that plays as the trust level increases, the opportunity for corruption also increases. And this, this played out in increasing complexity, which is a story that we tell throughout the last thousand years from the emergence of paper money in China, all the way to central banks. And, uh, and that's where Bitcoin comes in because it's the first non-material instantly transportable money that can deal with all kinds of complex economic relationships, but doesn't need to be trusted, doesn't have an opportunity for it to be corrupted. So that was kind of a scenic route approach to answering your question. Um, and I, I hope that helped a little. Yeah, definitely. It, 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 I think uh, when, we, when we talk about money and uh, you touched on it with, with trust a little bit, uh, trust is involved in money so deeply. Um, and maybe to Diana, like what makes uh, trusting in money good? Like why are people trusting in one sort of money and not in other forms money? And why will, will they then choose just Bitcoin? I, I get that all a lot from, from especially people that are kind of thinking about Bitcoin in a good way. They want to get Bitcoin uh, in, in their heads and they're like, oh, I, I get that Bitcoin is a new form of money. They don't only see it as an investment, as a gambling thing. Uh, and they're like, but but people still have to trust things. Uh, why should I trust Bitcoin? And I'm like, yeah, you can verify it. And then they're like, ah, but I'm not a coder. I, I cannot <laughs> verify Bitcoin. Yeah, so um, the trust issue is really interesting. And even to look at that factor across um, the spectrum of what we talk about in the book from Mesopotamia, we talk about the Lydians and the Greeks and the Romans, the Chinese, the Medici in Italy, central banks that start... Um, you know, in Sweden, we talk about, you know, a lot of different cultures and the, the trust varies depending on the time period, um, who is in, you know, the sort of the ruling class, if there is trust, if there isn't trust. And I think um, in the modern world, what we're seeing with fiat is that because I'm an educator, this is something that I spend a lot of time thinking about. I think there's a breakdown in education to where Students are really, and this is particularly in the West, 
um, I'm American. And so that's what I'm, you know, can really speak to, but also in places in Europe, but I, I've, you know, I'm, I've taught kids, um, that are even like their parents are from China or they're living in Taiwan. So I have, you know, kind of across um, a spectrum of, you know, it's all anecdotal from my own experience, but I've also done research that the education, there's a breakdown. And so students are told what to think, not how to think. And there's a, a sort of a dumbing down of the curriculum globally that we're seeing, if you look at a textbook from 1850 or even 19, you know, 20 versus what we see today, what they were doing in fourth grade then is almost high school level now. And so there's this sort of dumbing down of the world. There's this lack of interest in curiosity. And when curiosity is extinguished, then you just kind of live blindly. I mean, there's a whole category of literature, dystopian literature. And where people just kind of like in 1984, for example, by George Orwell, they just blindly follow the state. And of course, you have a few of the heroes that are going to, you know, kind of push against that. And I think in the modern world, it's the Bitcoiners that are the heroes. Um, but if you kind of get people complacent where they don't have to think about certain things and they don't have the curiosity or even the will or the drive, because it's all been kind of just pushed out of them their whole life then that's where we're at with the culture. And um, you can, you know, I can pinpoint different part, you know, things that have happened in the history of education of what, how we get here. However, um, we're here. So what do we do? Well, that's one reason I'm a homeschool advocate. So I think that's where the trust issue comes in, is that people have just learned to trust. They trust the schools to teach their kids for six to eight hours a day, and they don't even have to think about them. In America, in some um, cities, they don't even have to feed them breakfast or lunch and sometimes a, a snack after school. So there's two to three meals that the families don't even have to think about anymore because it's being taken care of. So they don't have to worry about nutrition. They don't have to worry about education. They leave the moral education or morality up to other people. So basically, you are completely trusting of the system and that's been ingrained in the culture and how they do that is by controlling the money inflation reducing the value of money over time and then you have to have two parents working outside of the home and it's just it seems very you know this kind of sinister there's some dr evil in the background and i don't know if it was always that intentional i think there have been nefarious players over time but this is the state of the reality so people have to trust because they have to just figure out how to work to pay their bills. Everybody's just hustling to make a living for the most part. And that you just don't have the brain space or the time or the energy or even the mental wherewithal of how to do things on your own. Do you see the, the education system in a, in a sense also decentralizing with, with homeschooling? I also see um, a lot of Bitcoiners are homeschoolers, uh, like uh, there's a big community around that. Absolutely. And that's my, that's really my um, crusade in this lifetime is Bitcoiners. If you're going to decentralize your money, if you want to be a sovereign individual, you have to get your kids out of schools. I understand like in Germany, for example, it is illegal to homeschool. However, I argue you can deprogram and you can still educate your children. You can take their brains back. And I try to help as many people um, with that, I always tell on Twitter, contact me, I can help you with curriculum, I, you know, where to find even free resources, the legalities, what you can do to take back your child's minds. Because that's really the future, right? This is the next generation. And it's not even just about learning Bitcoin. It's about saving the minds of the next generation. We do have uh, an entire chapter actually devoted to the issue of centralization versus decentralization. And we provide many examples of, of this conflict that happened over time in history. And one of the uh, examples that we used was, in fact, education and how in the early part of the um, American history, um, education was much more decentralized, which is to say that it did not have a governing authority that imposed a, a, uh, a particular um, method and, um, and system upon the populace. 
but was rather um, more, uh, uh, it, it rather left decisions about education to individuals. And that's really the heart of what um, centralization versus decentralization means. It's actually the topic of the next book in this series that I'm writing is education. So I'm going to tell the story of education going all the way back to ancient Greece, to the modern world, and kind of how it's evolved and what's changed and how things have gotten where they are. I want to tell that story because it's something I've researched and it's been really close to me for a long time. I think that could be a really good book for the Bitcoin community. I, 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 I feel like a Bitcoin community is striving for um, kind of Bitcoin related content that is not really Bitcoin content. Uh, and I think decentralizing education, the history of uh, education, what has been wrong with education, uh, that could be a hit. <laughs> I, yeah, I could I'm already hoping. tell you. <laughs> I, I, I'm hoping. I'm really interested in it. And um, I got my doctorate in education in uh, 2016. Um, I went back to get that because I thought I could fight the corrupt system of colleges and academia in the States from the inside, realized that it wasn't possible. And six months later, I walked away to become a homeschool advocate and curriculum um, builder for homeschool and then a private teacher. So um, I researched it a lot while getting my doctorate and unpacking it, and I continue to do it. Um, and it's just it's like, you know, watching a train wreck. You can't like take your eyes away. Not that anybody would want to watch a train wreck, but you just can't peel your eyes away because it's really scarily and horrifically fascinating. So I can't wait to tell that story. Could be interesting. Sorry, you, Joe, you are I, correct. I, in, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I was just going to add that you, you are absolutely correct in saying that Bitcoiners are looking for non-Bitcoin specific material that still aligns with your values. And we all live under this umbrella of values that attracted us to Bitcoin in the first place, namely uh, independence, um, all these virtues that used to be time honored civilizational values like honesty and integrity but also proof of work, doing your own work to validate information. Uh, these are all values that we live by or um, or contemplate as Bitcoiners that attract us to each other. Now, it would be great if there was um, information that spoke to that and uh, not just information, but cultural artifacts like art and um, uh, and film and, uh, you know, all these other things that make up a culture. But that's what we're striving to do, I guess. And uh, our book is just uh, one way to add to that pile. Um, but I would actually like to um, emphasize the, the point about trust from earlier, that um, the trust is, uh, in, in the context that we speak about it, is an economic um, concept in which people, t uh, they defer the validation of the money that they're using to some other entity. Um, it could be another person. It could be uh, a centralized authority. It could be a bank. Um, it could even be someone you take out a loan from. But what you're saying when you give your trust to a monetary system or a piece of money is that this represents value that someone else vouches for. And so I don't necessarily need to validate or vouch for it myself. I just accept that someone is doing it for me. And that um, that issue, that, that those choices that people have made for now going on millennia uh, was, uh, an, it's, it's an absolutely crucial component of the story that we're trying to tell because by deferring your, your own personal responsibility to validate um, the money that you use, it leads to other entities taking advantage of that and getting and and corrupting the system and then the value that you place in that money is no longer valuable it's it's um it's something that is now out of your control but it, it's important to realize that it had to be that way in order to have complex societies where you have trade that takes place across oceans you have to be able to trust the money that you use or else you're not going to be able to make the transaction. You can't take a ship full of gold and over to the new world. And with all the risk that that involves, like shipwrecks or just not, or the time involved in transporting that, that value, uh, you can't uh, sustain a, a functioning civilization without 
something that allows you to tr transport that value over great distances almost instantly. But that is that is the beauty of Bitcoin. We've come to the, a point now where we can have those transactions and um, and have it be trustless because now we have a way to validate it like we couldn't do before with um, with money that had the value of portability but um, but could easily be corrupted. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss slash Robin to get your bitbox. And if you really want to bulletproof your self custody setup, your security setup, and maybe even your citizenship setup, you have to talk to the Bitcoin way. If you go to the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you get a 30 minute free call where you can dive deep with them if your self-custody setup is secure, if your citizenship is secure or maybe might be improvable, or your digital footprint in general is secure. They are the experts in cybersecurity, in Bitcoin self-custody, and how to be a secure, sovereign individual in general. I love that a lot. And and maybe also to the, to the point before on, on what you just said with... with uh, Uh, centralization and decentralization plus that what you just said is is there any uh also with educating a little bit is there any realm where like centralization makes sense is is there like uh particular things where you like centralization actually uh, does make sense and do you also touch on that in in the book um, yes yes we do uh, i know deanna wants to jump in on that no, right go ahead. Yeah. okay <laughs> all right so um yeah we we actually do talk about some of the values of of centralization um, because, uh, and we do have a couple examples in the book, um, where it, it can make sense. Ultimately, um, we, we come down on the side of decentralization because, and, but not in every single circumstances. Um, one thing that centralization can do is provide standards that, um, that are imposed by one entity. And it could be a government, it could be a, um, a company, for example. Uh, it sets the ball rolling so that we can then exist in that ecosystem, but then we still have to make up our own minds and say, okay, that's, those are valuable standards. So we will continue to play by those rules. Um, so the initial centralized entity started it, but from our perspective as individuals, we'll still need to validate it on our own to say that it is good. But if we don't do that, that's where it gets easily corrupted because now we're delegating our own independent minds in judging those, uh, those systems that were um, uh, conferred to us. And, um, and now that can be taken advantage of by nefarious actors. So, um, so I, I think ultimately... I think we advocate for just making up your own mind, using your own proof of work, validate everything that you come across, but understand that it's um, something, sometimes it's not easy to do or get the ball rolling with. It's interesting. Um, yeah. One thing, if that's okay, Robin, what I want to say about centralization also is context. We think of centralization like the United States government, the massive, massive entity. But centralization can go even down on the family level, right? So maybe you have a family or a family with an extended family, and maybe it is the patriarch who is the centralized figure in the family, or maybe the matriarch, the mother, and she keeps the household running, and there's a division of labor. So you can look at it sort of this macro, these huge entities that want to control, but All of us in some way or another have some centralization in our life, even the most sovereign individual. If you look at it as there's one person making decisions for others, right? And so that's kind of the idea. It's just on how you want to do that and what you're okay. And that, again, that goes back to that trust thing, right? You would trust your family. Well, hopefully you would trust your family with those sort of that level of centralization. And 
that, you know, paterfamilia is a thing that goes back to the Roman Empire or the Roman even Republic, this idea that the father is the head of the household and that the emperor would become head of the state and it would mirror that role. And that's how you get kind of past this idea that we will never have another king in Rome is that the emperor is paterfamilia um, to the entire empire. And so you can kind of think of centralization in a lot of different ways. And it doesn't always have to be these huge corporations or massive NGOs or state governments. You can have it and it can be okay. So there's, um, I think a lot of it is mindset and just really being present and making those rational decisions in your own life, what works and what doesn't work. And then being able to say, I was wrong. I messed up. That's okay. I've learned something. And as long as you're learning something, then you move forward and you find another way. It's it's an interesting concept, this idea of centralization and decentralization. One interesting point that I, I think I wrote it uh, like last week or a week before that, where it was about how many people work in companies and how many people are freelancers and how many people are on their own and stuff like that. And it was, I think about, I think it was a US study uh, where 35% around that number are currently freelancers or have a one person company or something like that. Uh, and the studies show like in the next like few years, uh, this will rapidly grow. And I also see it already now in my friend circle uh, more and more people actually uh, just work for like one, two companies or three companies. Uh, they can set their own schedule. They, it's more, um, uh, it's more based on an actual work and less on, oh, you spend time in work. Uh, <laughs> also a concept that we have in, in school a lot, like, oh, you sit in school to sit in the school and not to learn something. Um, but, but. Do, do you also see that the decentralization of, of the workplace? And is that also related to, to the money and all the things that we already spoke about? Definitely. I mean, I'm Joel and I are both living it. I used to work in a centralized system in a public college system in California. And I don't work that. I left. And then we had a company. We had a small family company of um, creating homeschool curriculum based on the great books. And... Um, then we shut that down because we moved um, to Florida during COVID. And then we've moved to El Salvador since a year ago from Florida. And so um, I have been pretty much a gig worker in education. I work as a consultant uh, for a writing center in the United States. I have my own tutoring that I do. Um, I, you know, I'm writing my Bitcoin books. I'm, you know, I'm working with Bitcoin Beach on an education project right now. You know, this idea of gig worker and it's really, there's the stress of, you know, trying to figure out how you're going to pay your bills because you don't have that check. But it's, it's also very empowering being able to follow what you want to do and being able to shift on a dime in case that that vision changes, which I have had happen since I left academia in 2017, I've shifted several times on what I thought I wanted to do when I grow up, so to speak. So I think it, it allows for a lot more flexibility, which I think allows for a lot more individual happiness. Well, I think it's also important to know that um, the fiat system has so many incentives in place that not only make it easier for you to get sucked into uh, the standard employment situation uh, where you clock in and clock out, but it also sets up barriers to people who want to escape the system. And, uh, you know, there's, there's all kinds of incentives against going to um, your building your own business, for example, having to uh, spend so much time, energy, money, and resources on, on regulatory and, um, and, uh, other um, uh, other requirements of law, like providing health care for your employees, um, these are all things that make it so incredibly different, uh, difficult to be independent. But that is a function of the incentives that are put into place by high temper, uh, high time preference system, uh, and that the the fiat uh, system imposes. So it's. It's unfortunate and harder, but uh, but the reward is your own sovereignty. 
So it's, it's a, such an interesting topic for me, uh, the decentralization and also with workforce and, and with, with money. Um, there's one uh, topic that, that I had in my mind because someone brought it up in a podcast. I, I don't remember his name, unfortunately, a few podcasts ago. Uh, we talked about that. I'm not sure which one it was, um, where he talked about Bitcoin will be the final uh, development of money till we might end up in an energy abundant uh, system where we just have so much AI, robotics, energy, it's everything in an abundant flow that we don't really need the concept of money anymore. Is that something that is is even possible to think about that we, we live in a system where, where money uh, is not, an, not, not even there because the, everything is in, in, in overflow there anyways? Okay, so... I want to preface this because I'm ready to pounce on this because that I'm I'm just going to preface this by saying that that is um, communist wish, wish fulfillment. Um, but to be specific, um, the nature of human beings is uh, basically an alternative between life and death, a choice that human beings have to make between life and death. And because human beings have a choice about this, and they have a conceptual ability, the ability to think in, in conceptual terms, the manner in which we pursue values that uphold our life um, can be practically infinite because of the, who we are as distinct individuals. So that means that there's, as human beings, we will still want for things regardless of abundance and if that is the case and we still produce values, we are still able to produce values that we can trade. If we pr produce values in a surplus that allow us to trade between human beings, we will still need a, um, an intermediary that allows us to create effective and efficient trade. And so that money, um, that whatever that money is has to at its root be it has to serve the functions of money and those functions as we all know are a medium of exchange and a store of value as well as a unit of account the ability to 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 use that monetary element to be the thing that we use to count value with so that means that uh if if that is uh, if we still have to have that it still needs to be valuable to be used as money, and that means it has to be hard to produce. It has to be scarce. Um, uh, it has to have all these these qualities of money, which we talk about in our book, by the way. Uh, and we have it. So, if we as human beings will still want for things because of the basic alternative we have between life and death, and we're still conceptual human beings, we are still going to need money because our want for things is going to be infinite. I think this topic is interesting and it always brings to me Malthusianism where um, there was a, um, he was actually a cleric, somebody from the church, um, Thomas Malthus and in the late 1700s, early 1800s. And he um, wasn't the first with this idea. I mean, some of these ideas go actually back to the ancient Greek. Um, you can see philosophers even from the East and the West that have had this idea that the that there's only like humans will go extinct at something, something is going to happen. And then there, there will be no longer either a need or an ability for humans to continue. Well, Malthus had this idea that it's in anthropology, we call it carrying capacity or in biology, that the planet can only sustain so many humans to feed so many humans. And he argued in the late 1700s, almost 1800, that within 100 years, humans would go extinct because we would outgrow what we would be able to produce agriculturally to feed ourselves. This, I mean, diet for a small planet in the 1970s was another case of this. And we keep seeing this over and over and over again. And everyone talking about how AI is going to replace humans, I just see it as this sort of another wave of Malthusianism, although they're not dealing with, you know, the planet and being able to be fed, but it has to do with the human mind that humans are no longer going to be needed. And somebody that interacts with AI who tries to teach my students positive ways to use AI to enhance their thinking as opposed to replacing their thinking, we still need human ingenuity. I mean, we are problem solvers. And so one thing I've thought since I even understood this whole um, 
idea that the planet can only feed so many people is that we are innovative. Humans will figure this stuff out and we will solve problems in order to figure that out. And I don't, at least in this moment, and again, show me something, I'll read it, I'll research, and I can be changed. My mind can be changed. But in this moment, I don't anticipate the human brain, at least within my lifetime, being able to be replaced because we still need that ingenuity. And I don't know how you program that. I don't know how you program free will. I don't know how you program. And maybe there are ways to do it, but I haven't, I have yet to see, you know, proof of that. And I tend to be quite Aristotelian. I, I want to see the proof. I am a researcher. I'm a scholar and I need the proof is in the pudding, so to speak, in order to think. And we can speculate. That's interesting. That's fun. It's a great discussion. But until I see something that's going to change my mind, it's hard for me to imagine because being a historian, I've seen so many examples over history of this sort of doom and gloom for humanity. And it's really, it's like the boy who cried wolf. It's hard to believe at this point, at least for me. Cool. I, I love those answers a lot. Uh, they, they are really going deep and uh, I think we explain it very well. Thank you. Um, one other question, uh, a little bit change of pace. Uh, who did orange pill whom? <laughs> um, well, Joel orange pilled me. Um, we were actually, before we were married, this was in 2011. We were in Los Angeles area. We were sitting in a botanical garden on a bench, having a lovely afternoon And he told me about this crazy internet money and my head exploded. And um, so I have been hearing podcasts in the background and have been hearing about Bitcoin for that long. Um, but I wasn't all in until I'm embarrassed to say more recently than I would want to admit. But we all have our journey, right? And I was in the fiat world. I grew up and I didn't know about money. Money wasn't talked. We didn't have allowance um, like for doing household chores, it was just responsibility. So we didn't get like paid as children. So I've never had a healthy relationship with money. Um, I didn't have a lot of money growing up. I didn't have a lot of money most of my life. And then I got this really cushy job as a tenured professor making six figures. And I went down that fiat rabbit hole, like there's no tomorrow, right? Very, very, um, for the moment spending whatever. And now I kick myself because I had heard about Bitcoin for part of that. And, you know, I could have been stacking sets once we, you know, we were early on, it was hard to, Joel will tell his story about um, trying to get Bitcoin, but that's okay. I'm really okay with it now, which is that fuels my crusade to help the next generation, to make sure kids don't grow up with that naivete or even unhealthy relationship about money and economics that I had. So it spurs my life's work now. So I, I'm, I don't begrudge myself. We always have regrets, you know, if I could go back in time, blah, blah, blah. But that's my journey. And I, you know, I'm okay with it. And that, and I can tell that story and be like, yeah, so I wasn't all in for a very long time. And that's okay. Because that in itself has given me more conviction today than it would have if I would have just said, oh, yeah, cool. And then been all in like my conviction comes from a lot of my own experiences and it's not wavering because of that. I just um, I'll just add to that that uh, you use the word that I use often when we talk about Bitcoin and that's conviction. Um, knowledge isn't something that you attain that's an like an on or off switch. It's not something like you ascend the ivory tower and now you know everything as if it's bestowed to you by a deity. No, it's, it's a process. You go through it like a spiral and you, you learn a little bit here and you learn a little bit there. And the more you learn about a thing, if it's actually real knowledge, you gain conviction. And the truth was as much as I, I, I can look back on my journey and say, I knew about it early. I got it early. I knew what the propositions were. I knew they were sound. What I didn't have was conviction. And it wasn't really as much a matter of knowledge. It was um, a matter of context. And, and then having the strength of the conviction that drove me to action. And so I, um, and Deanna and I have often have these conversations about Uh, forgiving ourselves for not having the conviction earlier enough to, to take action. 
And I struggle with that sometimes because I knew about it earlier enough for it to make a substantial difference in my life, but I didn't have the conviction to take action. And I think that's something that every Bitcoiner is, if they're not, if they haven't struggled with it yet, they will. So is, uh, is, the, is this conviction building, um, uh, a, a time thing and a knowledge thing where it comes from the and, and how did you who build it it's it's all of those things but i say, i think at the root of it all is your personal context because we all come from a a history that makes us biased towards certain ideas um, or even we are faced with circumstances where we may be too distracted to put in the proof of work to understand what we should do. So, you know, and this is particularly the case if you're in a fiat job, uh, as Deanna and I both were, you know, we, we spend all of our energies trying to exist within that world. And we have very little mind space left to, to focus on um, something that could be beneficial, not now, but like a decade later. So it's absolutely a personal contextual issue, but you still, in, in order to get conviction, you have to do proof of work. You have to put effort and focus uh, and then reach that stage where you can take action. And sometimes you can take action without having real knowledge or conviction, but this is where people lose their Bitcoin because if they don't really understand it enough to have the conviction, they will not have the conviction to hold on to their Bitcoin or they will be... Um, they will be terrified when they have an 80% drawdown and then they'll sell at the bottom. That's what it, to have conviction is to have enough knowledge to hold on to it, even in the worst of times. How would you say if, if at all, uh, did Bitcoin impact your, your lives? Did, did Bitcoin have some, some, some impact in, I mean, of course, uh, financially is, is, is always there because all of a sudden you have the hardest money ever on, on your balance sheet. That's always <laughs> good for financially, but did it impact uh, something else also? Uh, well, we're in El Salvador and we wouldn't have chosen El Salvador. Um, so a little over a year ago in the States, There's been, I don't know if anybody's actually seen a news story about this, but there's been a lot of political stuff going on in, in the States. Sorry, sarcasm. Um, so uh, they, um, when they started going after Trump, whether you like him or not, that's not the American, that's not what our founding fathers um, have, what they fought for. And I've said this before, but my family goes back to the Mayflower. So I, on one side of my family, I, I am a member, card carrying member of the Daughters of the American Revolution, meaning I have family, many family, quite a few family members that fought in the revolution. I love the constitution. It's the first time in history. And since that time that there's been a nation founded on ideas, not on war or nepotism or any of these other things where we get nation states that are founded. This is, was actually founded on ideas. This is a principled founding of a country. And that means something to me because I try to be a principled person in my life. And I grew up with a father who was very deeply um, steeped in love of country, not because of what it is now, but because of the, that founding. And so when the last straw for me was when they went after their political rival, and I don't care what side you are, it's going back and forth. And I said, I cannot live in this country and watch it fall. I love what it was founded on too much to stay. So Joel and I decided to move to El Salvador because we're Bitcoiners, because we saw what we, Kelly was doing um, last year. And we wanted to be in a place where we could live a more sovereign life There's more opportunity. This is the most op optimistic place that I on the planet. And I hear that from a lot of expats and a lot of people that come to visit El Salvador and that are saying that same message. The Salvadoran people are, they're responsible. They're not going to just want handouts from the government. They're out there on the side of the street selling coconuts or little inner tubes down here by the beach. And they're all about the hustle and having proof of work to show value. They want to put their time and energy into receiving money, not just get a handout. And there's happiness and joy and optimism here. So we came down here to try to live on a Bitcoin standard, which we're doing the best we can. We pay our rent in a roundabout way. We pay our rent, but we get our groceries. Um, we pay as many Ubers as we can. 
or, or rides because we don't have a car and so we hire drivers but we try to live on a bitcoin standard and i'm a huge proponent of circular economies because i think that's how bitcoin spreads is actually using it not just as a store of value because most people in the world aren't in a place where they can actually save money yet because of the fiat system so bitcoin is our entire world is bitcoin now um so it's had a huge impact on our lives really cool and when you see um also now el salvador and you recently with one year moved there what what will the impact on on creator society be when we have this bitcoin standard i mean in el salvador the, it's the beginning of the bitcoin standard it's not a full-blown bitcoin standard till now uh but you probably can see a window in the future a little bit more than in other <laughs> in other countries already um what what do you imagine uh the, the the world look like on a on a bitcoin standard you mean as a as a whole or just here in el salvador Oh no! As a, as, a, as a whole, like when, oh, when, the, when well. the world is actually getting like, oh, Bitcoin is the thing, and and we live on on Bitcoin standard, kind of. Okay, so um, and I'm really glad you asked this question because uh, it's a proposition that just fills me with joy. Uh, there's a lot of uh, attempts to uh, characterize El Salvador, and I'm just going to use El Salvador as an example. I know you mean a larger context, but uh, in El Salvador, they liken it to where Singapore was 40 years ago. Uh, given how um, the uh, the the foresightedness of the leaders of Singapore at the time led to an economic renaissance, um, this little backwater, um, you know, uh, tip of uh, an archipelago that no one had thought about, suddenly turned into a financial hub and um, and created. Uh, immense opportunity and and prosperity for its citizens. Here's the thing, though. Um, I, I think in that comparison misses the boat. Uh, it, it's underselling the potential of what Bitcoin can do. And um, what we're really talking about here is uh, Renaissance Italy, Florence in particular. The, um, the economic revival led to a flowering of, of culture is really what I think the, um, what the ambition should be. And I think what the actuality will be, because when you take away all the, the incentives and, and really restrictions that the fiat system puts on a culture, you get all these crazy schizophrenic sociopathic behaviors because the system itself is schizophrenic and sociopathic. So that is what the culture results in. When you have a monetary system that is sound and hard and true and, um, and has integrity and requires proof of work and requires, um, it, it requires those values from its users, what kind of culture could that bring to our planet? That is really the... Um, what we should be striving for, but I think what will um, happen if we succeed. And and that's where I think it's going to happen. That's I, that's the direction I'd like to see. Uh, it's definitely an extremely beautiful direction, uh, uh, I, I have to think. Um, we have in the in the podcast usually an end routine uh, with two questions. The first question is always the question that is the same for everyone. Uh, and the uh, second question is coming from the previous guest. Uh, as we have now two guests, I thought I give uh, the question is always the same one uh, to Diana and the second question, the end routine question uh, to Joel. Uh, but uh, feel free to add something if, if you want to add something on the other question also. So Diana, your question that I ask all my guests uh, now is what can we learn from you besides Bitcoin? So I'm a teacher, so that I think that there's a lot you can learn, <clears throat> but I would say the impact of reading um, and what that can do for, you know, humans, reading um, stories, classic literature, reading it's all different types of genres, because what it does is that it teaches us how to react to other humans. It teaches us how to be human. And in this world of AI, where we start seeing more and more digital, where we're just interacting on our phones, but not really with face-to-face -face humans reading these stories, we can learn like 
Um, I'm having a conflict, but I read this book and this is how they dealt with it. And I didn't like that outcome. So now I know not to do that. I can do something else. Um, so for me, it would be the impact of stories and trying to connect with them. And I know not everybody wants to just read books, but even, you know, some of the greatest works over time, whether it's philosophy or reading primary sources in history, but just um, expanding your mind outside of your comfort zone to um, become a more robust thinker and even a more robust human in a way. Really cool. Uh, I, I like it a lot. Reading and even also writing, it, it, it helps. Uh, like I have writings that I just have for me privately because I like to gather my thoughts and clear them up. And writing helps a lot with that. Uh, and I probably never publish them. Maybe I do some some compilation of that, but uh, I have to have more time for that if I actually want to publish the things also. Uh, but until now, like it, it just helps to, to write things down. It's really cool. Um, for you, uh, Joel, the end routine, uh, as I said before, uh, the end routine is usually the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. And the question is an interesting one. Uh, how could Bitcoin transform the music and movie industry and how could they use their Uh, broader audience to orange pill uh, the world? You really, um, th this question actually touches on something that is actually quite personally interesting and, um, and important to me because I have a, uh, a film background. I went to film school. I used to live in Los Angeles, uh, worked a little bit in the film industry, nothing major, but I do have IMDb credits. And, um, uh, and so The, the the deeper question is how Bitcoin can influence culture and and culture is, you know, music and film is part of the things that drive culture. Uh, with film, I've, I've actually given this quite a bit of thought. Uh, Bitcoin does have um, some really useful application to um, uh, to funding the creation of art. The problem currently with uh, with not just filmmaking, but a lot of creative endeavors is that there are so many financial barriers to entry. It's And with film, it's an incredibly expensive medium. So you end up having a lot of really passionate people uh, choosing to work in that industry for nothing. And and you, in order to make any kind of impact in that world, you have to work for nothing um, for at least, you know, five, 10 years before you get anything off the ground how do how can people like that get um get uh, a benefit from a bitcoinized world and i think that one of the um and perhaps the first use case for bitcoin is a store of value so if you can um can create uh, or if you can save in bitcoin and be able to live off that for a while you'll be able to pursue your art like you never would have been able to uh, have uh, pursued it in the past under a fiat system. Uh, but that's just one way on a personal level. I think it also opens up the door to funding mechanisms that we haven't even dreamed of yet. Uh, the ability to, um, to pitch your ideas outside of the, the current system to make what you have to offer open to um to and get past the guardians of the gate the the gatekeepers is that is disintermediating and and that can have a profound change upon the uh um on, upon that in i've got specific ideas i've got broad ideas i think it's a great question i think it will make an important difference in the future wow uh, really cool uh, i love it i Uh, an and, and unexpected deep deep answer to, to the question. <laughs> It was unexpected. Bitcoin fitting touches for you. so many things, you know. So you can talk about any corner of the universe and that has human value attached to it, and find a way that Bitcoin has a connection. Very very cool. Uh, perfect. Uh, thank you both for for coming on. When people want to reach out to you, uh, either one of you, where, where can where can people find you? Where can people reach out to you? We have a website for our book, shells to satoshi .com. So that's a good start. Um, I'm also on Twitter at Dean Paris 2012 or Classical Educator is my handle. Um, so I'm pretty active on Twitter as well. 
And then Joel and I will also be at Adopting Bitcoin here in El Salvador in mid-November. Yeah, and we also have um, a weekly show that we do on Twitter um, that's part of the Daily BTC Network. Um, Daily BTC has a show at um, 8 o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock in the morning um, Eastern Time. So, uh, so we do the Wednesday show, and we make frequent appearances on the other show. Uh, on the, uh, all the other shows, but our show is called the uh, um, the Beginner 101 show, where we talk about uh, uh, various beginner aspects of Bitcoin and money and all those things that that touches. Um, so we're there every week uh, for two hours. So we'd love to have you listen. Um, just look for Daily BTC Show or just follow us. You can follow Deanna, D in Paris um, 2012. And me, I can be reached at uh, on Twitter at Trader Joel, or my handle is Argumentative Bear. Uh, so you can search for that as well. And um, yeah, and check out. Oh, and our book is available on Amazon. We it's available uh, in ebook form currently, but by the time your listeners hear this, the paperback version should be available. Really cool. Perfect. And uh, thank you, Diana. Thank you, Joel, for, for coming on and joining us today. Also for everyone listening and watching. Thank you for joining us today. And always, uh, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye. Thanks, Robin. Thank you.